Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed the country's annual Victory Day parade. He said soldiers are once again fighting for Russia's security. New sanctions on Russia from the G7, and both First Lady Jill Biden and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau visit Ukraine. Find out what was discussed. We hear from the former leader of Black Lives Matter amid questions about how the organization spent millions of dollars. She says it's a false narrative that she had millions from the group's global foundation in her bank account. Ukrainian fighters trapped in the Azovstal steel plant are vowing to fight till the end. Russian forces started shelling the plant again over the weekend after all civilians were evacuated. And today's Jessica Beatty reports. Heavy shelling again by pro-Russian forces at the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. The Ukrainian fighters trapped there are the last holdout in the city. They vowed Sunday not to give up. We will always continue to fight for as long as we are alive for justice. He's with the Azov Battalion, which has been associated with neo-Nazi imagery and accused of war crimes in the past. Ukraine says it's been reformed. Another fighter says surrender is not an option. And the surrender for us is unacceptable because we cannot grant uh, such a big gift to the enemy because <clears throat> every, person, uh, every person who were captured is the exchange fund, is the resource. Ukraine says all women, children and elderly civilians have now left the plant. This footage shows some of the last evacuees arriving in Ukrainian-controlled territory Sunday, after weeks of being trapped in Azovstal's underground shelters. With every day, more and more, we had doubts that we'd be brought out and that we're going to be left behind there forever. Another evacuee says it was a scary ordeal. I didn't know whether my relatives were even alive, what was going on at all upstairs. I mean, there was a bunker and then the upstairs. It was very scary, very scary. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky said authorities would now focus on evacuating the wounded and medics and helping residents elsewhere in Mariupol to safety. Meanwhile, Russian Deputy Prime Minister Marat Kusnulin said Sunday he visited Mariupol. That make him Russia's most senior government official yet to set foot in the city. Mariupol's key to Moscow's efforts to link the Crimean Peninsula, annexed by Russia in 2014, with pro-Russian regions. According to Russian media, he said the port should be used to bring in building materials to restore the city. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Russia marked the 77th anniversary of its victory over Nazi Germany. President Putin addressed a large military parade, claiming that Russian soldiers are defending the motherland in the Donbass. In Moscow's Red Square on Monday, Russian President Vladimir Putin gave a speech at the country's Victory Day parade. He repeated the narrative that justifies the invasion of Ukraine, citing what he calls external threats to split Russia. Preparations were openly underway for another punitive operation in Donbas and an invasion of our historic lands, including Crimea. Kiev has announced a possible acquisition of nuclear weapons. The NATO bloc began active military development of the territories adjacent to ours. This was an absolutely unacceptable threat systematically created for us and right on our borders. The Victory Day event is held on May 9th each year. It marks the anniversary of the Soviet Union's victory over Nazi Germany in World War II. In his speech, Putin compared the conflict in Ukraine to Hitler's invasion under the Soviet Union. The Russian president greeted politicians and veterans at the ceremony. He also directly addressed soldiers fighting in the Donbass region of eastern Ukraine. Dear comrades, today the rebels of Donbass, together with the Russian army, are fighting on their own soil. We are fighting for the homeland, for its future, so that no one forgets the lessons of World War II, so that there is no place in the world for executioners, punishers and Nazis. Putin also mentioned the loss of Russian troops, pledging to help the families of fallen soldiers. Following the parade, he paid tribute to war victims at a memorial by the Kremlin. On the same day of the event, Russian satellite TV was hacked. Menus were altered, with every channel showing anti-war slogans. One slogan said, you have the blood of thousands of Ukrainians and hundreds of their murdered children on your hands. Another said, the TV and the authorities are lying. No to war. Also marking the day, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky addressed the nation in a recorded video. 
He condemned Moscow for repeating the horrific crimes of the entire Hitler regime and said his country would win the war without ceding any territory. Across the country, ordinary Russians also took part in the Victory Day celebrations. Let's hear from some of the participants. In central Moscow, citizens gathered to watch the Victory Day parade. Most of them showed support for their president. It adds patriotism and pride for my country to my feelings and the understanding that no enemy will break us and the urge to show that we are the country that won't bow before anybody. I teach at a community college and our boys support it. We had a concert with our students. All of them supported it. Not only teachers, but the kids too. They support the military operation. Yulia is a member of an amateur choir. They celebrated Victory Day by singing Soviet World War II songs. We are at war. I feel sadness and sorrow as our young boys are dying on the front line. It's a hard feeling. Gayan expressed sadness over what is happening in Ukraine. I have a very ambivalent feeling because I feel very sorry for the civilians that are suffering now in Ukraine. The children, the old people, they are suffering for nothing now. I feel very sorry for them. Residents of St. Petersburg mark Victory Day with a traditional march, holding portraits of their loved ones and ancestors who fought in World War II. The event was named the Immortal Regiment. The first march took place in 2012 in Siberia with about 6,000 participants. This year is different because this year you feel more deeply all the reasons why all of this was happening in the past and the echoes of the past that we're facing now. Oksana has a son who is of draft age. She said she is worried about his future. I know many mothers whose sons are now of conscription age. They do not know what to do with themselves. They have problems with their blood pressure. They cannot sleep. They do not know what to do. They are trying to find any way to save their children from going to this war. Hundreds of thousands of Russians participated in events across the country this year. The number almost returned to pre-pandemic levels. Protesters in Poland drenched the country's Russian ambassador in red paint as he attended a ceremony marking the 77th anniversary of the end of World War II. Ambassador Sergei Andreev was attending a wreath-laying ceremony at a Warsaw cemetery where he and staff were surrounded by demonstrators. The war in Ukraine has cast a shadow over this year's Victory Day when Russians honor the 27 million Soviet citizens who lost their lives in World War II. Poland is a strong supporter of Ukraine and has opposed any large-scale commemoration taking place. Before leaving, Ambassador Andreev told cameras he was proud of his country and his president. Andreev reportedly told the Russian news agency he and his team were not seriously hurt in the incident. G7 countries will impose new sanctions on Russia. That's the conclusion of a virtual meeting on Sunday. And First Lady Jill Biden and Canada's Prime Minister both visited Ukraine on Sunday in separate unannounced visits. NTD reporter Jeremy Sandberg has more. At the conclusion of the G7 meeting, leaders released a statement outlining new Russia sanctions and pledged support for Ukraine. The G7 is a political forum made up of the United States, Canada, France, the UK, Germany, Italy, and Japan. The new measures include sanctions on Russia's TV stations, banning Western management consulting services, sanctions on Russian oil, tightening export controls, and sanctions on Russian and Belarusian elites. A senior U.S. administration official says Western companies spent more than $300 million on advertising with Russian TV stations last year. According to the White House, the U.S. government wants to stop American advertisers from funding Russian propaganda and limit Russia's revenue that increase its military capabilities. The U.S. imposed around 2,600 visa restrictions on Russian and Belarusian officials and a new visa restriction on Russian military officials. All G7 countries announced they would either phase out or ban the import of Russian oil. Japan says it will take some time to phase out its Russian oil imports, but is committed to the move and the unity of the G7. The meeting was just before Victory Day, when Russians celebrate the defeat of Nazi Germany during World War II. During the virtual meeting, G7 leaders talked with Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky. Zelensky said around 60 people were killed in a Russian bombing of a Ukraine school on Sunday. In an unannounced visit, First Lady Jill Biden met with Ukrainian First Lady Olena Zelenska in western Ukraine for a surprise Mother's Day meeting on Sunday. President Joe Biden did not make the trip. People of the United States stand with the people of Ukraine.
The visit lasted about two hours and was held at an undisclosed location. U.S. diplomats returned to the Kyiv embassy in Ukraine for the first time since the invasion. The embassy is not reopened yet, but the visit is a step towards returning a full U.S. presence in the Ukrainian capital. I'm thrilled to be able to return to Kyiv, as I said earlier today, Victory in Europe Day, to observe the triumph of good over evil in the city I love. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau also made an unannounced visit to Kyiv on Sunday. Trudeau met with Zelensky and announced the reopening of the Canadian Embassy and new weapons and equipment for Ukraine. Building on our recent announcement of the provisions of LAVs and heavy artillery, today I'm announcing more military assistance, drone cameras, satellite imagery, small arms, ammunition and other supports including funding for demining operations. Canada is removing trade tariffs on all Ukrainian imports to Canada for a one-year period and is allowing temporary residence for Ukrainian families in need. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Now to the U.S. One of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter is denying wrongdoing. The last 11 months have been turbulent for the former leader of Black Lives Matter, Patrice Cullors. She faced a barrage of questions about how BLM Global Network Foundation spent tens of millions of dollars. And not only that, but concerns that she personally benefited as a prominent voice in the group. In one case, the Indiana Attorney General filed a lawsuit against a BLM charity for failing to disclose its financial information. Here's Color's defense. You know, the idea that Black Lives Matter Global Network Foundation received millions of dollars and then I hid those dollars in my bank account is absolutely false. That's a false narrative. Colors admitted that she made mistakes and lost trust during her six years guiding the foundation, but the activist denied she ever wrongfully used donations meant to help black people. At issue is the foundation's reported purchase in 2020 of a compound in L.A. for $6 million. Colors addressed this as well. We looked at commercial buildings, we looked at, you know, homes, and then we found this really amazing space that's a sweet space spot between commercial and residential that has office spaces, that has parking, that has, yes, a home on the property, but also has a sound stage where you could do podcasts and you could do uh, live events in the backyard. The property is in the Studio City neighborhood of Los Angeles. It includes a home with six beds and six baths, a swimming pool, as well as a sound stage. The property is meant to be a meeting place and a campus for a fellowship of black artists. Colors addressed concerns that she was hiring her family to work on the property. I think it's important that people understand that while my brother is the head of security and my mom and sister did work at the property, there are also dozens of other people who work in the organization um, that are black folks and are doing amazing work. It's not like I literally opened up the bank accounts and was like, I'm bringing all my family and friends in. Folks had skill sets. BLM raised $90 million in 2020 after protests over the death of George Floyd, but the organization drew criticism after the announcement. That was over who had access to the donor funds. Local chapters and others also called for more transparency about the foundation. And coming up, Australians head out for early voting. Find out what they think of the current prime minister and whether a change in governing party is needed. And Beijing loyalists select Hong Kong's next leader. He is set to be the city's first leader with a police background. He used harsh measures to crack down on pro-democracy protests. We'll have more for you in just a minute here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. 
Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, and as you know, my passion is to help each and every one of you get the best sleep of your life. That's why I created my new Giza Dreams bed sheets. I started by using the world's best cotton called Giza. It's only grown in a region between the Sahara Desert, the Mediterranean Sea, and the Nile River. It's ultra soft and breathable, but extremely durable. I guarantee you they'll be the most comfortable sheets you'll ever own. I do not like my sheets. I love my Giza Dream Sheets. I'm interrupting this commercial to bring you my BOGO extravaganza. For example, you can buy one of my Giza Dream bed sheets and get a second set absolutely free. Or my six piece towel sets. Buy one set, get another one absolutely free. Or you can get my classic premium my pillow and get another one absolutely free. So call the number on your screen or go to mypillow.com. Use your promo code to get my buy one, get one free offers and get deep discounts on all my pillow products. Early voting is underway in Australia two weeks ahead of Election Day. Surveys show the opposition Labor Party extending its lead and Prime Minister Scott Morrison suffering a fall in approval rating. A widely watched survey shows the Labor Party leading 54% to 46%. That's against the Liberal Party, National Party coalition government led by Morrison. The campaign has been dominated by cost of living pressure, national security and climate change. Millions of Australians are expected to cast their votes in person over the next two weeks at over 500 early voting centres nationwide. Advanced voting has gained popularity in Australia. About 40% of the electorate voted either early or by post in the last national election. Electoral Commissioner Tom Rogers told ABC Television he expected those numbers to increase during, his election, during this election. France's Emmanuel Macron was sworn in for his second term as president on Saturday. He promises to lead with a new method in a country where presidents are rarely re-elected. Macron won 58.5 percent of the votes in an April 24th second round against Marine Le Pen. In a short speech, he said his second term would be new and not merely a continuation of the first. Among the 500 guests present were former presidents Francois Hollande and Nicolas Sarkozy, as well as former prime ministers, religious leaders, and other state figures. Hollande, who threw his support behind Macron in the second round, told reporters that Macron could not afford to reproduce the methods of yesterday and that some citizens voted out of rejection rather than out of hope. The once dominant parties of Hollande and Sarkozy, the socialists on the left, and Les Républicains on the right have been severely weakened in recent years, in part due to the rise of Macron's political movement, though a newly united political left is hoping to deprive Macron of a majority in a June parliamentary vote. Economist Rodrigo Chavez takes office as Costa Rica's president for the next four years. He is pleading pledging to play he is pledging to pay off commitments that have given Costa Rica the highest debt in Central America. Chavez is a 60-year-old who ran on an anti-establishment platform to become Costa Rica's 49th president. He says he will keep public finances solvent. Costa Rica has a total debt of $42 billion. Chavez took the presidential chair from Carlos Alvarado, who has governed since 2018. Alvarado says he left the House in good order, in order with stable finances after the blow of the CCP virus pandemic. Chavez is a former longtime World Bank official. He stepped down from that position after allegations of sexual misconduct. He denies those claims. Chavez says he will guarantee the rights of the LGBT community and that he will not tolerate discrimination against women in Costa Rica. John Lee will be Hong Kong's next chief executive. He was endorsed for the city's top job on Sunday by a committee stacked with pro-Beijing loyalists. The only candidate, Mr. John Lee Ka Chiu, is returned in the above-mentioned election. Hong Kong's former deputy leader, John Lee, will become the city's next chief executive come July. Lee received a majority endorsement for the top job on Sunday, with 1,416 votes from the city's election committee, which is stacked with pro-Beijing loyalists. Eight voted to not support him. As the sole candidate, Lee has vowed to re-establish Hong Kong's image as an international city after several years of political upheaval. Set to be the city's first leader with a police background, Lee was partly responsible for ending the city's massive protests that began in 2019 when he was security minister and enforced a harsher regime under a national security law imposed by Beijing in mid-2020. 
The law has since been used to arrest scores of pro-democracy politicians and activists, disband civil society groups and shutter liberal media outlets. What remains now are faint voices of dissent, heard this morning when three League of Social Democrats activists showed up to protest the small circle election. Police stopped them from nearing the election venue. Lee will replace Carrie Lam, whose popularity has plunged over her rocky five-year term. Voting in the Philippines' national election concluded today, with some polling stations forced to stay open for last-minute voters due to long queues and system glitches. Polls were expected to close by 7 p.m. local time, but some voting centers kept their doors open for voters who had queued for hours. And some stations experienced glitches in their voting counting machines. The Elections Commission did not extend the voting hours, but did allow votes to be cast by voters who were waiting within about 30 yards of the polling station entrances. An unofficial vote count showed a huge early lead for Ferdinand Marcos Jr. That's the son and namesake of the notorious late dictator who ruled the country for 20 years. The official counting of ballots is expected to start on Tuesday for the 65 million registered voters. The unofficial count by the Election Commission accredited watchdog will start later on Monday. And still to come, the Wings for Life World Run raises almost $5 million. The race saw runners in countries from around the world all join part of the same race. We'll have... The horse that held the longest odds of winning the 148th Kentucky Derby comes out victorious. The long shot winner was only able to enter the race after another horse dropped out. Rich Strike was in 17th place down the final stretch, but blasted past other horses from the inside to cross the finish line first. The winner came into the race with 80 to 1 odds. That puts Rich Strike in second place all time for the upcoming longest odds to win the Kentucky Derby. The horse netted a $1.86 million payout. Yahoo Sports says the race had the fastest quarter-mile start in history, which may have tired out the lead horses down the stretch. The only horse to win the Derby with longer odds was Donna Rail in 1913. Over 160,000 runners across 165 countries are taking part in the Wings for Life World Run. They raised almost $5 million through entry fees and donations for spinal cord research. There was no set start or finish line at the race. People all over the world joined the run, either at one event, seven large-scale group runs, in organized groups, or on their own via an app. Everyone around the world set off at the same time, meaning for some it was a night race, while others took part in the day. The hottest temperature that runners had to face was in Jaipur, India, where it was 108 degrees Fahrenheit, and the coldest was in Greenland at 18 degrees Fahrenheit. Nina Zarina ran almost 37 miles in the United States to win the women's race, while Joe Fukuda won the men's race, running just over 40 miles in Tokyo. It's cherry blossom season in Toronto, Canada, and many residents spent Mother's Day taking in the pink and white blossoms that hit peak bloom earlier this week. High Park, home to thousands of cherry blossom trees, was open to visitors for the first time since the start of the pandemic. Visitors are seen taking photographs of the cherry blossoms and posing for pictures with family. Today is one of the best days of the year, Mother Day, so I have two kids and I'm so happy to be their mom and I really enjoy this day. Today is a beautiful day, it's finally warm and the cherry blossoms are blooming, celebration. I wrote some poems and I bought her uh, flowers for Mother's Day and now we're celebrating uh, by seeing the cherry blossoms. Like their famous counterparts in Washington, D.C., the cherry blossom trees were a gift from Japan. In 1959, the Japanese government shipped 2,000 trees to Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email on screen. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City.
Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.